afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, coming in from the top rope, John I'm Cena. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah, that's probably really loud. I forgot my mic was hot. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> we set a rule for us before we started recording. I said, he's like, ABB asked, is my mic a little hot right now? And I was like, yeah, I think it's fine. As long as you don't get like too hyped during the show, we should be fine. And then we got yeah. the we get in the moment. Enter, enter pan flute. Yeah, it's okay. We're here. I backed up. Sorry, everybody. i glad to be here, y'all. I'm excited. We have a uh, uh, a little bit of a special episode coming to you. Uh, not a standard guest, but I was having a conversation amongst the Birdie fam uh, because we were talking about tournaments and prepping and rules, and we'll we'll work it all in there. And I I said I said something along these lines, ABB, that was. It's always hard to do tournament content, especially even on my channel, not because I'm looking at it from the standpoint of like, well, it just gets less views and all that. Mm -hmm. It's hard for it to even get out to the public because it gets less views. The YouTube machine like chews it up Mm -hmm. and doesn't actually push it because it gets less views. So it's like it's not even a matter of, oh, I wouldn't want to do it. It's like it literally is not as helpful because it's not getting to as many people. Right. But. This podcast is all about helping beginners build their bag, things like that, so that you have confidence before you even get to the course. Well, I'm sure that we have a lot of listeners that have not played in tournaments or have been curious about tournaments. Mm-hmm. And so what a great opportunity to let this become even more educational of a podcast and talk about tournament prep, getting ready, getting back into the swing of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think for those of you even who are not like, Hey, I'm going to go play a bunch of tournaments. Maybe you're not quite there. Maybe you just don't have the desire to play tournaments. I think there's a lot that applies, even if you just care about like maybe gaining a few strokes out there or, um, you know, just having some more like consistent disc golf. I think all of that still applies to you. So don't click off. I think there's still a lot to be said there, even if you're maybe not a tournament type player or maybe you're taking a break from tournaments for a while. I think there's some good nuggets for everybody. Yeah. So, uh, we, we want to talk about before we dive in though, y'all, you continue to blow our minds. Uh, Mm -hmm. and so we have, we, we are pulling guests continually from, uh, the disc RPM community. Uh, so if you head over to disc RPM.com, there is a in the bag community there. It's free to join. It doesn't cost any, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have over 1300 people who are part of this community, which is mind-blowing that there's Mm -hmm. that many folks here yeah it's it's crazy and again my favorite thing about disc rpm i love seeing everybody's bag and like your your actual disc pictures are in there which is awesome like i'm um looking at carter one eye uh just looking at his disc collection he has like this sweet like uh get freaky zone and there's just a lot of cool stuff savigio is this guy's name all blue bag uh, a lot of thought space, very cool dyed uh, Lozado Hex. So I love, I love, I love this app. I love this platform and I appreciate them kind of working with us to kind of develop it really for our community. I mean, that's really what it's there for. You can see mine and Robbie's bag at all times. You know, we're going to be talking a lot about tournament prep, which I'm sure is going to talk a lot about like what discs are being stabilized, what spots are covered, that sort of thing. Is that a new Topanga? Yeah, she's new. Uh, see, I didn't even know that. And like, I'm looking and I can see that at Robbie's bag. So that's the cool part about disc RPM. And um, make sure and you can add notes in there. You can really see what your bag looks like. And you can put your collection in there too and swap disc in and out of your bag as they come in and out for different tournaments and such. Yeah. So I that's one of the things I was going to point out, like for sure, is, is if, if you're putting disc in, we're going through uh, and we have admin access. So when you get in there, the more ways that you provide of us being able to contact you makes it way easier. Uh, I know that I have had some people where like I've looked and I've been like, wow, that bag would be incredible. Um, and I'm looking mm-hmm. at it, but I have no way to contact you inside of disc RPM, like the information you gave when you signed up for disc RPM. So if you fill out your profile, like flesh it out a good bit. Um, and then I'll tell you the people that put in their pictures much more likely to get chosen to come in, mm-hmm. to be in, in the bag uh because even i'm laughing at carter uh one eye uh that brad just mentioned because i was like wow what a cool die that he has on all of his pictures yeah. but then i'm realizing like it's incredible because it's his thumb yep. from holding the disc up yep immaculate yeah i love it uh so that's not carter we're not making fun of you bro uh it stands out 
Yeah, and it's very cool. it also has the distances in there, mm-hmm. um, filled out that information. So the, like I said, the more information y'all give us, the more excited we are because it just raises more questions on our end to be able to give you a better fit. Um, yeah, maybe we need to talk to Carter. He's got some doomsday in there. We haven't really talked to any doomsdayers yet. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, well, I will check it out, Carter. So you're, if you're hearing this, make sure you get that information in. Uh, so that way we can reach out to you, brother, get you on the show. Yeah. Cause I'm looking at Carter's bag and I can, I see a possible area when I actually click on it. Um, mm-hmm. so y'all very, very excited for this. Another two opportunities that we've had is it's been sort of the dream for foundation podcasts that, uh, we will eventually every podcast is kind of kind of push off onto its own channel. Mm -hmm. So we've already seen the Exodus feels like the wrong. I I feel like when you hear Exodus, you think Mm -hmm. bad. Uh, But we know Exodus is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, Think of it like if you, you know, you want to grow a new tree, you need to get a branch off a said tree or a seed from said tree and plant it beside the tree to make a grove of trees. That's what we're doing. Yeah. And so we're we're groving. We're groving. We're gro- We're grooving and groving over here. So mm-hmm. we've seen it with uh, Grip Locked has split off and they're doing their own thing, which also means that if you are a fan of the Grip Locked show, then they, they're they allowed to make more content. And now Correct. you're not, if you're a Grip Locked fan, but you're not a Tour Life fan, wherever you land on that side of the war, mm-hmm. uh, we're not throwing our hat in that mix right nope. now uh, and never will. But uh, if you like Grip Locked content, now you can just get more Grip Locked content without occasionally getting a notification of like, Oh, here's tour life stuff. Or if vice versa, if you're a tour life fan and you don't want to hear about the quote TMZ, uh, of, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's like depending on where you land. So in the bag, we're currently in the mix with foundation podcasts. And what our goal is, is eventually we're going to split off as well. So that channel has been created, but it's not up yet. Like in terms of going, it's, you cannot easily find it. So mm-hmm. we want to let you know that we're going to be doing a thousand subscriber giveaway on the, in the bag youtube channel uh mm-hmm. but we also have an in the bag instagram channel that avb has been running tell me what you've been doing on there yeah i mean just trying to communicate and connect with you all um we've been getting a lot of messages so a little behind on those but i've been trying to reach out uh those of you who are trying to get on the bag and are sharing your disc rpm link getting you over to robbie kind of like coordinating and looking at like the schedule um uh, but my new thing i'm going live on wednesdays or thursdays depending on our filming day and uh, like last week, I threw in the rain for an hour with you all. It was a lot of fun. And then uh, today, we didn't have anything to throw because we're doing a conversation episode and a dis- discussion. So we did a little warehouse tour. We looked at um, my personal collection behind me, some of the special discs on there. We talked about new discs that are releasing this week, uh, showed them a couple of discs that are releasing a little later on, which is cool. Um, so a little sneak peek. So they got to see the sticker bomb fridge, which was fun. We've never really showed that on anything before. So um it was great i love hanging out with you all there's you know past guests come in and out of there as well as just some some people that are fans of the show it's fun to interact and love answering questions and doing q a's whether i'm throwing or i'm over here it's always a lot of fun and again to robbie's point that's kind of what we're hoping with this podcast or switching over to our own pod our youtube channel is if you're an audio listener literally zero is changing for you it'll be exactly the same but if you're a youtube watcher um, it will have our own channel. And again, we're not just going to do the podcast every week. We're hoping we can do some lives, uh, maybe do some other like small segments or shows, uh, maybe, you know, do some reaction content to people throwing the discs we recommend. I mean, there's like all kinds of opportunity to do more content there for you all. And that's kind of the whole premise of why all the podcasts are going to their own in their own lane. So you can get more of the content that you want from those podcasts. So if you're listening to this one now. We appreciate you. We're trying to give you some more content. That's all going to be happening sooner rather than later. We'll give you more details probably in the next two weeks. We'll have kind of solid details for that. Yeah. So we are, we're very, very excited for it. Um, I, I just, I agree. Like the, there are so many things that have to happen in order for us to make this show happen uh, Mm -hmm. that don't get seen. Uh, And it's not just like, oh, we are doing admin stuff behind we're writing show notes and everything it literally it's like we got to go find guests we got to talk with the guests Mm -hmm. uh and we gotta throw like we gotta throw um brad and i have to talk about like what are we what are we trying out so there is so many details but like i it i think it'll be a really fun to bring you guys behind the scenes of all of it but today today we're doing a discussion episode because brad on friday we're filming on thursday so Mm -hmm. 
Friday evening or on yeah, Friday evening when you guys are hearing this, I will be in Georgia uh already and have played a practice round because I took over a year off of competitive sanctioned tournaments uh so that I could kind of improve my game, try to work on my game, mm -hmm. come on the other side and feel like an overall better player. Um, and I want to kind of talk through that process a little bit, but really highlight in, okay, I'm coming back to tournaments. What did I do to prep for this week's tournament for Saturday and Sunday's mm -hmm. tournament? Um, and lessons we can learn from that. And then we also over on my Instagram and in the bag, we asked for questions for people about tournament, tournament prep. Uh, and we want to answer a lot of those. So mm -hmm. Brad, you ready to dive in? Let's do it. So um, got this tournament coming up. Uh, I'm going over to a course that is a, it's a private course over in Griffin, Georgia. Uh, mm -hmm. And the thing about this course is that I have been playing this event for the past since its inaugural event, uh, which was, I think three or four years ago. Um, and so I literally, I missed it last year, but I've played it every other year since. And, uh, the thing about this course is that it changes almost every year. Uh, it is on this guy's private property. It's on his parents, private property, 60 mm -hmm. acres, huge amount of land. Uh, and there's these two brothers and one of them disc golfer, the other, loves to ride dirt bikes okay so i can already they, see it when they first built the property it was just the disc golf course like when they first flushed it out it just had a disc golf course on it here we go and then the next year you came back you started seeing inklings of like a dirt bike trail works through it mm -hmm. and then now that has now evolved to where like some of the greens literally like you can't get a skip into the green because there's like a dirt bike wall uh, oh, nice in front of it. So that's fun. Create some really cool opportunities. If you can be 20 feet, you can be on the green, but 20 feet left, you have a wide open, easy putt 20 feet, right? You're literally having to like arc over a hill because of the dirt bike trail. That's cool. So very unique and Hayden changes it up all the time. Um, so he dropped a flyover of the course. One of the big things that I will say in tournament prep, um, and a lot of, a, quite a few people ask this question uh, is how do you prep for a course that you've never played before? You're playing blind, uh, mm -hmm. whatnot. Um, and one of the big things is, is if there is coverage of some form on the course, I always suggest watching that. And my, my assumption is always if a line looks, however wide a line looks in the woods, mm -hmm. reduce it by five to 10 feet. Okay. Because I don't know if you like, Courses you've seen, a great example, uh, think of uh, New London, right? Mm -hmm. So we've obviously, as foundation fans, we've all watched Hunter play New London at least 12 times. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen others <laughs> play New London a few times. Uh, I go to like hole eight in New London. Okay. So right after the quote easy par five, mm -hmm. um, that hole, you watch people throw down it and you're like, oh, that looks like a somewhat like tight hole but the fairway is pretty defined mm -hmm. brad how is it when you actually get on that hole like it way 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 tighter than you think i mean f feet like a not w less wide feet tighter than you think it's going to be like it's it's surprisingly not so yeah. easy not so easy at all yeah, because I mean, you see, and it's like, oh, the gaps that are having to hit are like 300 feet down the fairway. And it's still like a 10 foot gap mm -hmm. that they're trying to weed through. And then we're watching on camera and we're like, man, that must be kind of bad. They shanked yeah. that shot a little bit. Right. It's like, mm, I don't yeah. think so. If I tried to hit a doorway or a garage door size gap 300 feet away from me, I think I would struggle. Yeah. Oh, I think I, I would. There's not even a question in my mind. Yeah, I think that whole course for is a good example of like not what it seems. Like I don't think at least from my perspective is longer way longer than you think it is like on on like video and definitely the lines are a lot tighter and the OB is dangerous. So and I think that's for me my hardest thing about tournament prep I think not playing a course I would have played and I haven't really played one I have not played before. 
But I think going in, I would worry about OB a lot because again, I think there's like a good course design. You can see where the natural OB is, but some of like the staked out OB, that's always like, you know, things are always a little tighter, even with tournament, just because of the lines and the ropes up. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, that for sure is true. For sure. Is true. So you got to hope that your like tournament director is going to give a decent amount of information and stuff ahead of time for you to like mentally prep. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you can't see it, one of the biggest things like, and honestly, what a surprise because they posted this flyover on Monday, but I'd already been prepping for a little bit before that. Um, but if they didn't post the flyover, I would have gone in honestly with the assumption of like, I guess that much hasn't changed, Mm -hmm. but they've literally added six or seven new holes that I've never seen before. Really? Wow. I, in fact, like said to, I have two birdie fan members who signed up for this tournament as well, who are in Georgia. Um, and I was like, I legitimately have no idea on that property where hole one is. Like I see that hole, but I like seeing the fly through Mm -hmm. couldn't tell you where it actually starts. Um, so if that, like I would have walked in a little shell shocked when like walking into the tournament. And so one of the biggest things that I always encourage people to do is get to know your discs and test them out heavily the week leading up to the event. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it'll be like, okay, uh, like I'm looking at, I have Brad's bag pulled up on the right and my bag pulled up Mm -hmm. and like, Brad's got his uplink, his origin, his hex, his fission hex, his eclipse hex, and his quake. So all mids that you're familiar with, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know what they do. Um, but depending on what courses you've been playing lately, like if you went and let's say the weekly last week was at Peaks View Shorts, you're not throwing a ton of mids on that. It's just going to be a lot of envies and zones all yep. over the place. Yeah. Well, what if you have gained a hitch in your throw that suddenly like some of your mids aren't flying as standard as they were when you're throwing them three weeks ago? It's funny you say that because that's kind of actually happened. Um, I played Peaks View Shorts yesterday. Ironically enough, I was teaching some people how to play and um, I was throwing my mids really far. So I just bumped down the putters for the rest of the time. Um, I slowed down my form a lot and that's helped. I feel like I get, I'm getting a lot more spin and a lot more power out and, you know, everything was flying a little, little more understable and a little 50 feet farther. So as that exactly happened. Yeah. And 50 feet farther, when you are playing a casual round, you're like, oh, that's a bummer that mm-hmm. I'm farther than I thought, but also like, that's whatever, like, oh, well, when you're playing a tournament now, that 50 feet could be the difference between a birdie and a par quickly. Uh, and also that 50 feet could be, oh, there's OB behind the basket. Okay, mm-hmm. well, I'm just going to throw a mid at this because there's no way that I reach that. But if right. you're throwing 50 feet farther, congratulations. Welcome to your free strokes because you just threw OB. Mm-hmm. So getting to know your discs, what distances you can throw them on, how far, like, okay, I need to see. I'm going to throw every fairway driver I have on a uh, spike hyzer i'm gonna throw it on a slight hyzer i'm gonna throw it flat i'm gonna throw it a little annie i'm gonna throw it on a hard annie and just see which ones can do what mm-hmm. because another thing that i think happens a lot in tournaments is you end up in weird situations that you you just didn't prepare for yeah. because the nerves are there so you've grip locked it even on a course that you may be familiar with grip lock something you were nervous you let it slip out whatever it may be it kicked a tree and you've been you're in a place that you've never seen before Mm -hmm. Well, if you know the weird lines because you tested every disc in your bag on so many shot opportunities, suddenly your brain's going to look back and think of those shot shapes. And now when you're trying to scramble, you're going to be like, oh, you know, I've never really taken my, like Brad's looking at his bag. He's like, you know what? I've never taken my evader and I've never thrown it on like a sky forehand Annie Mm -hmm. because if you had to throw that shot nine times out of 10, you're probably stepping up to your firebird to try to flex it out or mm-hmm. you're going super flippy with like the leopard three and throwing that there. Yep. But maybe that's not what the shot's asking for, but you're realizing, Oh yeah. When I test my evader on that, it actually held it. But at the very end, it just flattened. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm going to throw that. And then boom, you can get out of jail 
with that. So I love to go test all of my shots um, and do that repeatedly. Uh, but one of the biggest things that I tried to tell even my wife, she was like, you're putting more than you usually do. And I am someone who puts a lot. Uh, like it's an odd day if I'm not spending 15 to 20 minutes in my backyard putting. Mm -hmm. uh, like it's my dogs can run around with me. It's not like the most focused practice, but I'm putting almost every day. And she was like, you're putting a lot. And I said, yeah, because even if I throw really bad, I'm pretty sure I can get a 900 rated round just from being good at putting. And she was like, okay. Huh. <laughs> and I was like, cause here's the deal, Lindsay, I'm going to have to putt on every hole. If I throw really well, I don't have to necessarily putt too difficultly. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to putt on every hole. I will throw. I will throw 18 putts around. Mm -hmm. Sick. So I probably should work on that a decent amount because also once my putting feels good, then that takes so much pressure off of everything right. else because I'm not. Oh God, I have to be 10 feet away from the basket, or else I'm going to miss the putt. Right. I can, I have a little more leeway, I have a little more leeway on my upshots. So I, I love trying to practice that, but Brad, like, I'm sure you've seen this even in terms of like do warehouse putts for a little bit. And then all of a sudden what happens when you start missing the warehouse putts, we start changing mm -hmm. a little something or other. Uh, yep. I know you and Jason were doing like a, there was a section of time where y'all had the whiteboard out and you were doing our putting test mm -hmm. every day. Yep. Did you ever see any movements like in, Oh, I'm a little off today. And then you would tweak it and it would take you a couple days to like work it out. Yeah. I think I was saying this on the live, my putt feels good for the first time in like nine months, probably because I just, I was putting in my yard, you know, casual I was out talking to Kimberly, just kind of throwing some putts while it was a nice day. And I realized that, sorry to segue, this does have to do with what you're saying, but yeah. Um, I realized that I had been like for I'm doing some visual stuff. I've been putting like this versus like this. Huh. And I always used to putt with my fingers more. And it's like I, I felt for like nine months like I had no like umph to my putt. I had no pop. And I just happened to do it one time in the yard when I was not thinking about putting. I was just chatting, just casually, just let my hand do it. I was like, wait. And I just started draining them from like 30 feet, 30 feet, 30 feet. And I'm like, okay. I, but what had happened was I, I had an off day and I just started changing and changing. And then I changed putters and I changed my form more and changed my form more. And to the point where I had a power grip, like, and I can't believe I didn't notice that. But yeah, when we were putting all the time, I think we kind of stopped, uh, not really, we got busy really, but, um, I kind of stopped more cause I was getting frustrated. I couldn't get past a certain like percentage. And again, I was just trying to, I was like, all right, well, maybe I need to like crouch down more. Maybe I need to like load my back foot more, you know, just all these little things I was trying to change. Um, and none of that was a problem. Yeah. I, and the grip, I mean, that's, that's, I, I love doing putting lessons with people, especially in person, because that is one of the quickest things is like, I'll just, before we even start the lesson, I will be like, I'll do a little warm up, Like I do a little tricking exercise with them putting and playing catch. And uh -huh. then, after we finish that, I'll like walk up and be like, all right, so show me your putter grip and they'll show me their putter grip. And I would say if I've done 25 lessons of putting in the past two months, uh, probably 20 of them, we fix their grip before they even threw their first putt of the lesson, mm -hmm. because it's like, no, that that's not good. Uh, like you are just losing out on power and accuracy because of how you're gripping the putter. But Go, that's why we practice it, right? That's why we get mm -hmm. used to it. Because then if you're in a tournament and you start thinking about it now, Brad, you'll know, oh, you've gotten nervous. Check your grip. Like you've missed a couple putts and you probably will default right back into like mm -hmm. pulling them back in. But now like you've learned that because you've checked it on the practice screen, which is so helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I think you made a good point and it seems so simple, but you're, the only shot you're guaranteed to throw 18 times is a putt. Yeah. Like you could throw 18 forehands. And so all that work, like you could get to the course, especially if you're playing blind and it's all forehand holes. Very unlikely, but like mm -hmm. 
it could happen. Or mm -hmm. you could work on your forehand and you get there and it's like, wow, there are not a lot of forehand lines here. So all that practice goes out the door immediately. Um, so testing your discs over and over again, practicing your putt. And here's the other warning that I'll give you on practicing your putt, because some people will get to the week of practice or the week of the tournament and they'll be like, all right, it's tournament week. I got to be dialed in. I got to putt. I got to putt. I got to putt. And like mm -hmm. I said, I've been putting more this week than I have in quite some time, but I'm still not walking out there and being like, you know what I'm going to do, Brad, I'm going to putt for an hour every single day mm -hmm. because some days if i were to putt for an hour i would end up finding an issue with my putt yep. uh i have learned over the past two years of really having the channel and all that and really trying to like hone in my putting and everything is that where my baskets sit in my backyard mm -hmm. is a literal wind tunnel uh because we've got like this wood line and then to my house and so I will throw putters and they will like ride and then just suddenly just shoop, shoop, like wow. just drop yeah. to either side of the basket. And I'm like, I just don't really feel like I get that while I'm out on the course. Mm -hmm. Huh? So then when the wind starts kicking up, because if I putt for an hour, eventually there's going to be some gust of wind that's going right. to cause that. And I'm going to see that and be like, oh, junk. I got to like fix that. Mm hmm. So when the wind really starts picking up like that, I'm done. Not because I don't want to practice putting in the wind, but because I've already practiced enough to feel like I'm confident. All right, sick. Let it fly. I'm feeling good. And as soon as the putt's feeling good, I do usually two more like round. I have about 10 practice putters. Um, I do two more rounds once it feels good. And then I'm out. Yep. So some days that's going to take 10 minutes to get to. Some days. Like yesterday, great example. Yesterday, I realized, man, I'm just like not every putter that I'm throwing. These wizards are all coming out like on hard hyzer. Mm -hmm. That is not my putt at all. There's no way that these wizards on putting are way more overstable than like a KC AVR. Mm -hmm. And I could get those to be flat. So just give us some pop, Dennis. Give us some pop. Yeah. And that's what I did, but it took me 15, 20 minutes to figure that out and get back to, okay, this is why this feels odd. And then once it was good, hit it for two more sets. And then I pieced out. I went to the mm -hmm. course, had a great putting round. Like I, I cannot over, I cannot stress enough that when people put caps on putting practice, mm -hmm. I hear them either say, I'm going to do a hundred putts a day or I'm going to do 30 minutes a day or whatever. And there's these top ends. And it's like, after a point, we not only go to like diminishing returns, you actually start hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to, you know, I, I kind of do the same thing putting practice wise. I don't do a lot of putting practice currently. I'm going to start doing more. And I did more when I was playing tournaments since first started. Um, but I kind of applied the same practice routine I did for archery. I did competitive archery for a long time. And, you know, I would always, I started out by saying, okay, well, I'm going to shoot, you know, a hundred arrows a day. And what I slowly learned as I became more competitive, especially like in the week, coming weeks up to like a tournament or like a big event, um, I would kind of go out and, if like immediately I, I was like pulling stuff to the right or I was like my windage was off or whatever, um, I was like, okay, is it the gear or is it me? And then like that's where, because again, the archery component, there is gear associated with it, right? But I mean, to be fair, disc golf is the disc, is it the disc or is it me, right? Yeah. And then same same practice as you, I would go out, I'd hit, the, I'd hit a couple sets from the distances I really needed to be locked in on, very similar to disc golf, I suppose, and putting. And then, uh, once I started feeling myself like lose concentration, then I would stop because mm -hmm. I'm only going to start, I'm only going to hurt my confidence if I start like mentally getting distracted because I'm no longer focused in, in the moment. I'm not going to be able to smack myself in the face and be like, all right, focus up. Let's go. <laughs> like I'm already done. I'm mentally checked out. And from that arrow on, I'm doing myself zero favors. I'm only hurting myself. So yeah. I think like for me, as I'm prepping for some tournaments, I'm going to do this summer. I'm probably going to do the same thing because I think, you know, putting in my yard the other day, I had zero plan for how many putts I was going to do or the distances or anything. We're, my wife and I were just talking. The kids were out in the yard. And I'm like, 
I'm just gonna throw some putts casually, just for fun. Yeah. And I think I took more out of that like 15 minute session than I have any practice I've done in the last six months. Yeah. Let let your body work itself out. Uh, and that's why we practice as much as we do. Like mm-hmm. you spent so much time teaching yourself this is how the, like the bow is held here, like smooth releases, whatever it may be. I don't, I don't know the terminology. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to offend our archers uh, <laughs> in the chat. <laughs> Definitely. There's a crowd of people that you don't want to offend. It's people who can shoot a deadly weapon accurately. Yeah. Uh, so, well, but there's, there's so many similarities though. Like, cause with archery, you're really focusing on like your anchor point, right? You're focused on anchor point. You're focusing on a smooth release. You're holding your bow arm steady and next you're, solar plex or not your solar plex i'm sorry your scapula like flexing back you're like good form anchor point release i mean it's all the same it's just a different different weapon yeah one's made of plastic one's made out of graphite and metal i i when are we getting the graphite and metal disc that that probably takes too far yeah uh no so uh i putting practice can't emphasize it enough uh and i know for some people it's boring and maybe you don't have a uh a basket in your backyard so how do you practice that well if you can't get to a course and practice on their practice basket i'm always team shovel grab a shovel grab a broom something and set it down and you can paint you can like it's so cheap to go get a really terrible shovel because it shovels get more expensive based on the head of the shovel yep we don't care about the head of the shovel. I just want the stick. Uh, mm-hmm. So stick the shovel in the ground, paint like a two or three foot section on that handle and just put to the pole every single time. And then when you get to a basket, you're going to be like, this thing is massive. This is a barn. Mm-hmm. How am I yeah. supposed to miss? And it's going to feel really, really dialed. One of, I love uh, dynamic disc sent me two Patriots and I think it's phenomenal, but I still have sitting in the corner two really old cheap baskets Mm -hmm. that I can literally pull the chains right off of. And so I'll use my Patriots, but you best believe it this week. I have taken both of them, slid them to the side on certain sessions and just put my poles back out there and been like, bang, bang, bang. Um, Today is my last quote day of rest because tomorrow I'll head and I'll get to actually play a practice round on the course to see it, which I'm excited for. Mm -hmm. talk about that in a second but today i'm not going to throw a disc like i it will not happen all day Mm -hmm. i'm gonna putt but i will not actually throw and today will be a all right i'm gonna have that i'm gonna do pole practice i'm going to do my hardest form of putting practice on this last day of putting practice because all i can glean from it is confidence yep because if i'm missing on a regular basis well congratulations I just made this so much harder than it's going to be on the actual course. Mm-hmm. But by golly, ABB, if I'm succeeding. Unstoppable. Yeah. Like GG mates wrap mm-hmm. it up. So can't emphasize the, the importance of putting practice over and over again. Um, I know someone asked a question that I thought was interesting and I'm going to be honest. I can't say that I've ever done this in a hardcore manner. Um, someone asked, uh, do you clean your discs before the tournament? Uh, I think Scott Burdett actually asked me that. Um, yeah, yeah. So I know lots of folks who will literally like, I've seen, I know Aiden Scott's on tour. He's done it. Um, like they'll run the bath and just dump their whole bag of discs in the bath and like clean them all before it gets going. I personally never done that no i almost never clean my discs if i'm being honest yeah is that bad same uh the i literally i'm trying to think the only time that it ever gets close is i can think birdie fam takes over birmingham round three that we did this year the first round that we played of doubles with everyone we played in some terrible storms Uh, Mm -hmm. i'm sure you've heard about it from nate and jason like it was so wet and so when you're playing in constant rain, your discs get like a little muddy and they pick yeah. up like grass over time. So when we got back to the house, all of us wiped off our discs and set them out to dry. That's probably the closest I think I've ever come to yeah. like cleaning my discs. Yeah. I'll do that. Yeah, I don't. I think maybe one time I've ever like scrubbed a disc and I think it's been more of like, okay, I 
have now played for three months with this mud clumped on the inside. I'm kind of tired of that, so I'll clean that off. But yeah. I don't know. I kind of like my disc to be a little dirty. I, I think, I don't know, it feels grippier to me, I guess. No. Well, and like maybe you bought a disc from a used bin or something that like had a little dirt on it or something. I've seen mm-hmm. that. I, like, I've done that before, like a little clean and prep on that. But yeah, I agree. And some people are going to be in the comments like, well, you're wiping them off as you cleaning them. I Trust me, there's soap in my discs. I don't know that they've ever hit each other. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. Water, no. Towel, maybe. Water that's from the ground or from the rain, sure. Yeah, from the sky. Uh, yeah. We take that. Yeah. So uh, I would say that's one of the big things. Another big thing that I really would encourage is if you don't have the opportunity to practice the actual course you're going to play, then I would suggest heading to similar courses to practice those shots. So a great example uh, for this course is that there are several short wooded lines, like 200 to 300 foot short wooded holes. Mm -hmm. Well, this course is in Georgia. I live in Georgia, so I cannot practice it. So how do I do this? I even the two people that are playing this tournament with me both live in Georgia, but they don't live close to the course. Mm -hmm. So I sent them to another course in the area to practice short wooded lines. And I walked away with complete confidence because it was like, okay, I cannot necessarily practice these exact lines, but I'm throwing enough wooded tunnel shots with my putters and mids Mm -hmm. that I know how they're going to behave. I know what's going to happen. Um, there's a, there's a confidence that comes over and over again. Now I'm going to flip it on it, flip it on its head. Brad, are there, if you were to think about like courses in the Lynchburg area, Mm -hmm. are there courses that you feel like you have quote played too much, played too much, like played too much in the sense of you now have like, there's a, there's a level right where confidence hits here. And then we pass that confidence level and it's now not even necessarily overconfidence, but like, Ooh, gotta be careful here because it's like, I know I've done so many good shots on this hole before that if it's not a perfectly executed shot, I'm mad at myself. Yeah. I think that I'm probably getting that way with Tim Brook. Cause if I'm not shooting like four or five under, I'm pretty mad at myself and start doing some silly stuff. You, It's been on a video. You've seen it. Like, yeah. If, if you've watched that, um, so yeah, and I think Peaks View is kind of the, it's hard. Like Peaks View shorts again, it's where I started playing, so it was just it's just easy to be like, okay, whatever, and not really pay attention, and then start playing really bad all of a sudden because I'm like not even really focusing or I'm making da- bad selections, and then I realize I like gave up three easy holes, and I'm trying to like gain gr- ground back, and then I'm making more mistakes because I just got a little like cocky coming into the round. Yeah, I completely agree like i've got a couple courses in the area that if i play i'm like mm-hmm. Ugh, i have played these so many one of our local parks george ward i have played that i've been playing that course since i started playing disc golf in 2012 mm-hmm. so uh, i was talking with another longtime player in town and we were like in every pin position that exists out here because every hole has at least three pin positions mm-hmm. i was like i think at this point in my game i have like six or seven of these positions left that I've never birdied. So if I come out and play around, talk about disappointment waiting on you because it's like, well, you birdied this before and now you're taking a bogey. What are you doing? Dummy? Mm -hmm. Uh, Like that can happen. So I think some people in tournament prep will overplay a course to try to find confidence in it. And they're going to tell themselves like that's, that's why I'm playing it so much. I want to feel absolute confidence. Mm-hmm. But then we struggle to find this balance of like, okay, well, what if I have like, what if I threw the most amazing shot of my life on this hole once? Mm-hmm. And now I'm just chasing that over and over and over again. Yep. So uh, a rule of thumb that I tell people, if you're going to play a practice round on your course, if you throw a fantastic shot, don't think about that shot. Think about what you were thinking to make you throw that shot. Yeah. So you play, you play Timbrook hole one straightforward hole. Got to mm-hmm. throw a little uphill through a gap, 280 feet, something like yeah. that. Uh, so sometimes you'll pure it and people will be like, Oh, well I pured this. Like Brad's looking at it. What are you throwing on that hole at this point? Brad, are you throwing your FD? 
Yeah, the flippy FD, which is the wrong choice. So, like, if you're like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch to the evader. I'm gonna throw the evader. So you finally like talk yourself into I'm throw the evader. Boom, perfect. You're under the pin. Threw a right basket high, lands right behind. The next time you get up, the temptation could be, oh, I just got to throw that FD shot again. Mm-hmm. But when you threw it the first time, you were not thinking, oh, just throw the FD shot because you never done it before. Right. You were probably thinking, all right, I want I want a little bit of ante between the basket and the gap, the right side of the gap. Yeah. That's my aim. Point. Like, bang. A little bit of ante, 70% power. Poof. And it was perfect. Now, that's the thought that we want to rechannel mm-hmm. when you come back to it. Right. So can I piggyback off this concept a little bit? Just kind of like prepping for the course, right? Yeah. Um, here's something I found myself doing. Um, I ended up backing out of these couple turners just because of life things that happen. But I, I'm... You ever seen the movie Cool Runnings? Anyone oh, know yeah. that movie? Okay. Oh, yeah. So I always think about that scene where he's like in the bathtub and he's like, he has, they're throwing the pictures in front and he knows like how he's leaning for each like turn, right? I know that's like a typical like prepping for bobsled, right? And he's just like eyes closed. He like knows what turn, how to like, how to lean, all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, I kind of find myself doing that with the course I'm playing. So whether I've played it or not, most of them I've played before. So it's a little easier, but you can find videos like, um, one time a uh, tournament I played, I went on and watched uh, a foundation videos before I worked here and I watched the video and was like, okay, this is whole one. What am I, what are my, what's my goal? Can I get a birdie here? Or is this a, is this a par? Or is it a bogey? And okay, what is my progression, progression of shots here? All right. I'm throwing a mid to the middle of the fairway, uh, zone four hand up, putt for par next hole. Like I found myself going to that level of prep for it. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I I think mentally visualizing the course, super helpful. Just in terms of uh, the big thing that I think it does is I love not necessarily like, okay, I'm going to throw this disc on this hole, this disc on this hole, like overlocking yourself into that because what if the conditions are different? What if mm-hmm. it's a little windy or stuff like that? So knowing the adjustments you can make can be helpful there. Um, for me, the most valuable thing that I heard with you saying like that sort of prep is what hole can I birdie this hole? Can I not birdie this hole? Mm-hmm. And then when we, if we can, isn't an easy birdie, yeah. right? Like if I'm looking at Timbrook for you, can you birdie holes five and six? Sure. Mm-hmm. Like absolutely. You can birdie holes five and six, but I would not say that either of those holes are like a high percentage birdie chance mm-hmm. for you right now. Five is this like three way, three options and all of them are not great kind of a deal mm-hmm. trying to get to the basket. Six is a tunnel shot that has some elevation change to it. Tough. So looking at those, it's like, can I birdie them? Yes. Do I consistently birdie them? No. And to me, I'm looking at the divisions that exist inside the game. And so if you're in novice, MA or FA4, I think you need to pick three to five holes that you want to play aggressive on. Mm -hmm. And this will change depending on the the strength, like the difficulty of the course and everything. But honestly, I don't think it changes as much as people want to make it change. Because some people are going to hear, when I say three to five holes, pick those and attack those holes. Those are holes that I'm playing for a birdie because I know I can aggressively go for the birdie and not really bring bogey into play too often. Right. And then everything else I am playing for par. It doesn't mean that I have to like necessarily do the whole divide the hole by the number of strokes available. Like if it's a 300 foot hole, throw 250 foot shots mm-hmm. and putt, but it could be, okay, well, this is a 300 foot hole. I'm going to have to throw a fairway driver to reach that. You know what? there's a little bit of danger. I'm just going to throw a comfortable, safe mid Mm -hmm. throw a putter into the green. Easy peasy. Uh, like that is an okay strategy as well. It doesn't have to be 150 foot shot. It should be 220 foot shot Mm -hmm. because that's the most comfortable shot available. Right. Um, so find those. And then the other thing that's going to end up happening is because you picked three to five holes to attack. If you get those phenomenal, like you mentioned a Tim Brook, if you're not five under, 
you're kicking yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you picked three to five attack holes and you got all of them and then you parred everything else. Great. Congratulations. Yep. You shot a good round that you're proud of. Mm -hmm. And that's at Timbrook, which I would describe as a pitch and putt birdie or die type course, yep. because there are so many birdies out there that you need to get. And then there are others that maybe like, but even let's take peaks view. Okay, cool. Peaks view. There's maybe two holes from peaks view shorts that you're not trying to birdie. Right. Mm-hmm. But we still say three to five holes that we're going to aim to birdie. You get all five of them. Awesome. You are going to pick up other birdie opportunities. Because like Peaks View, hole one, not an easy birdie to get. Hole uh, four, hole five, not easy birdies to get. Hole six, mm -hmm. not an easy birdie to get. Hole seven, eight, not easy birdies to get. So I've already listed six holes that if you're playing for the birdie, mm -hmm. You could bogey fast, like right. go for hole five, miss the Mando. Uh oh, you just took yeah. four. Now we've moved backwards. Mm -hmm. So it's that that course expectation of like when you're practicing a course, when you're mentally prepping for a course. What are what can I attack? What can I attack easily? And then as you move up, I think that that scale jumps one attack hole. So if you're playing mm -hmm. rec in a three fa three, it's four to six if you're playing ma2 five to seven ma1 six to eight and then mpo i think you're picking seven Most to seven yeah. to ten uh because mpo fpo it's a different ball game like but the people listening to this podcast are probably not playing mpo and fpo mm -hmm. like they are trying to birdie every single hole at all times because that's what's expected it's not going to get more difficult than that but they also, if you're playing MPO and FPO, you probably have the skills and the putting prowess to be more aggressive and still save those holes. If you've ever played with someone who's pretty good at disc golf, you can agree to this when you've seen them. Like, think about the foundation crew, right? You're playing a weekly and you're on a card with, you said this on the podcast. So it's you, Nate, and Jason uh, on a card. You guys have to scramble. It's going to be tough scrambling, right? Mm hmm. But you flip, you put Jason and Nate not on the card for a second and put Clayton and Hunter on the card. Suddenly, it seems like they get, not only are they, quote, throwing better, but it seems like when they end up in, they can't seem to find bad positions. Right. Right. Are they not finding bad positions because they're good? Or do the bad positions not seem so bad because they're good? Seems to be the question, right? I think it's the latter too, because I mean, even if you know Clayton maybe chops off his drive, right, and he's sixty feet, he's probably I would give him seventy five percent chance he's making that putt. So that that matters too, you know. Yeah. Coming back to the putting part, yeah. And I think to me, and we asked this, I forget, this was a couple episodes ago, but I really do think that like putting is really what starts. You see people start climbing the ladder of like those amateur divisions when they start like putting well and consistently, it seems like to me. Yeah. Wes, uh, who is a friend of the show, um, we were, he was part of the discussion in the birdie team yesterday and we talked about consistency is really the, one of the big separators inside of that. Mm -hmm. And I think putting consistency shines so hard through that because I mean, you felt it, I felt it. There are rounds, especially for amateur players where it's like, I can make all of my putts. Amazing. And then there are rounds where if it's outside of five feet, nah, like, yep. and what shifts? I don't know sometimes. Um, yeah. Well, coming so, back to your picking holes to attack or numbers based on your, I think that's a great point. And yeah. I think by staying to that kind of plan and kind of like planning out your other shots, because you're going to have good shots and bad shots. So maybe, you know, hole two was not in the plan. You throw a great shot. Hey, you're already feeling confident. You're like, okay, well, I know the next one's my birdie hole. There's a couple more coming up. My putting's feeling good today. So you run a 35 footer, you make it, boom, there's a bonus one. And now your confidence is through the roof. You're now going to definitely birdie those birdie holes and then maybe pick up another one. So I think yeah. having maybe a, not a low ceiling, but a planned ceiling, I think is really good. I yeah. think just having that. For me, I have to have like more of a rigid plan because if not, I'm going to do something silly and try to like 
be a hero or like, oh man, I threw that last shot great. I, I can throw 500 feet today and I'm going to try to do it and then I'm going to chop something off and I'm going to get a bogey and then it's all downhill. Yeah. It's when people hear the attack hole strategy, I am not saying you cannot birdie other holes. Mm -hmm. And I love that you mentioned that, Brad, of like, I, I want you to birdie all the holes. I would love for you to plan on three to five holes. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I was just lacing them today. I went 18 down. Yeah. And Great. amazing. Yeah. Way to go. Uh, move up. Like it is, uh, <laughs> that is completely, I, I'm so here for it. Um, I want to, I want to address some of the, the Q and a questions. Cause I feel like I've gone through a lot. Um, and I want to start with, uh, one that you got asked in your mm -hmm. podcast, uh, which is any like tournament superstitions. Um, so, uh, one of these will lead into when you get to the like day of the tournament, how do you mm -hmm. warm up? Things like that. Yeah. For me, I go and I try to throw five to 10 forehands, five to 10 backhands ranging speed. Uh, <laughs> so it's like, I'm going to throw like three putters, two mids, two fairways and three distance drivers or whatever. Um, and adjust accordingly, um, on those warm up shots. And then ideally, if I have time, I'm going to try to play three holes of disc golf and just play them like normal, throw a tee shot, walk up, throw the approach, throw the putt, carry on so that I get my body used to mm -hmm. playing for the day. Not, I'm going to throw three shots off this tee and then pick the best one and here we go mm -hmm. from there. Um, so I love doing that. Another prep that I love doing is I love playing worst shot rounds in preparation for tournaments. Um, that's a, that's a weird superstition of if I get the chance to play a worst shot round on a course, I will always take it because mm -hmm. it's another, if my worst shot was, if I played worst shot and I shot a decent score, how am I not supposed to feel confident yeah. heading into that tournament? Right. Um, but my two like weird superstitions, are if I've not played a tournament in over a month, I love to get my haircut cut by someone else before the tournament. Uh, so I've okay. actually been like growing my hair a little bit back out yeah. um, because I knew this was coming. So I purposely let it grow out so that I could have a reason to go to a barber to have them shave it for me. Um, Interesting. Okay. Like, and that always has to happen the week of the tournament. It is so relaxing to me. And so like Lindsay got home yesterday and she was like, oh, tournament week. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, like she just knows that That's it funny. is a part of the, uh, and it's not every tournament I play. It's if I haven't played, like I said, in over a month. So I have another mm -hmm. tournament at the end of the month. I won't go get another haircut. Um, but so that's number one. Number two is when I get to the course day of for the tournament and I'm practicing and all that, I'll play my three holes and then I'll go to the putting green and I will, once again, I'm putting not to see if the disc is going in the basket or not. I'm just trying to make sure that my putting stroke feels confident that day. Mm -hmm. I could care less if it's going in the basket or not. I'm yeah. just trying to make sure it feels good because I've practiced before to know that my good putting stroke does actually go in the basket. Mm -hmm. But here's the weird one, Brad. I always end on a miss. Okay. So some people are like, well, if you end on a miss, you're going to be like shaky before you go in. But someone explained this to me probably my first year that I played tournaments. And it was so hilarious that it has always stuck with me. And that is, it's a numbers game. So statistically, if you're a decent yep. putter, you make more putts than you miss. Mm -hmm. So if I end on a make, let's say I make 80% of my putts inside the circle. That would be incredible. All right. Well, I just rattled off a bunch of putts on the putting green, and I'm making them over and over mm -hmm. again, and I end on that make. Statistically, next is a miss. That makes the sense. The odds of the next one being a miss are pretty high. But if I make 80% of my putts inside of 20 feet or whatever, and I end on a miss, statistically, next my one. next putt has yeah. a really good chance of being in. I like that. And y'all, I know it's just simply not true. But let me tell it lives. I'm a baseball fan of my heart. So mm -hmm. superstitions are like all a part of my core. Yeah. Y'all, it's so rent free in there. But yeah. I look like I. I have had times where I've like told myself, come on, Robbie, 
miss the basket. Like I won't let myself like egregiously miss it just to like be in a miss, mm-hmm. but it's like, I'll just start rapid firing putts to be like, duh, 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 duh. okay, bang. Mm-hmm. Sick. I'm off. Uh, so that's yeah, funny. that's my, that's my, my weird ones. You, Brad, you were saying you trying to think about, do you have any? No, I think I'm like maybe the opposite. And I, any, I don't know. I like, if I'm on like a tournament day of any kind, I'm going to grab gather some other experiences too. Um, I tend to not like to warm up at all. Mm. Like I'll stretch a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I'm not going to go like practice just cause I, I, in my mind, I should have done all the practice I need to do before. I don't need to go out there and start pretending like I need to be on my game or I need to do something different or I don't need to get in my head. So I probably won't. I may throw a few forehands just to warm up my shoulder only like that's yeah. for its only purpose, just mechanically getting it warmed up. So I don't stretch some, or tear something. But other than that, I don't like to throw beforehand. I don't like to play holes. I really don't even like the putt. Cause again, I'll get in my head with it. Yeah. Um, I kind of have a weird superstition at falling Creek specifically. Um, I will never practice putt on that basket. Every time I practice put it on that basket, I've had a terrible putting round because it's like a little shorter than normal. Yeah. So I'll, I'll never put on that basket, but um, I'm more of like, I'm going to jam like music really loud, like un annoyingly loud on the way there and just mm. kind of get in the zone and get like mentally clear. That's all I want to do, but I don't have any superstitions at all. Like, like z- probably none. Yeah. Oh, Man, I it's been so long since I played tournaments. I, I also my first hole, mm-hmm. uh, just the tee box on the first hole. Take it or leave it on whether you think headphones in the sport are bad, good. Uh, yeah. I as so I can confirm. I think that they are a absolute competitive advantage. Uh, like because I for a long mm-hmm. time when I played sanctioned rounds, I always had one headphone in, one headphone just because I still wanted to be an active participant in the card and the music is like so low that I can barely hear it, but I just want the tune like moving through my head. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I, on the first tee box of almost all of my sanctioned rounds, have a headphone in and I'm listening to Katy Perry's Never Really Over. Uh, Okay. uh, It is like, it was my most played song uh, two years ago when I was playing a lot of tournaments because it's every round, not the tournament, every round. Sanction mm-hmm. round, headphone goes in, never really over. Um, starts with I'm losing my self control, uh, and it's starting to trickle back in. And so right. I was always like, Whew, "Yeah, here we go, baby. Uh, let's do this, Katie." Uh, mm-hmm. And so I hold that near and dear. But this season, I'm gonna try. I still think I'm gonna end up doing like while we're waiting around, since you got to be there five minutes early. Mm-hmm. I think I'm gonna have her play before then. But I'm gonna try this first tournament, no headphone. And just see, let it ride. Awesome. Really mental resilience. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, some of the questions that I saw, and I want to kind of fly through them because we've had a decently long episode, Brad. Uh, so we'll make sure that we're, I, I, I feel like it's been good. I don't know about you. I've talked a lot. No, I think so too. No, I, I, I like listening and I, it's one of those episodes where we're always like, I think, I hope this is valuable. I hope we have a lot to talk about. We always do. And uh, no, I think it's as valuable. Like I said, for tournament prep people, it is tournament season. A lot of people are going to be playing. I hope all of you get out and just try, even if maybe you think, oh, I'll, I'll, I don't want to because I'm not going to do super well. But just it's it's fun. It's fun to meet new people and the environment's fun, in my opinion. Um, but I think it has a lot to apply for just your, if you're just trying to get better disc golf or score better, all of this applies to you. So now I'm excited to hear uh, what other questions you got. Yeah, so... Um... Someone did ask a similar question of like how much should be pre-planned for what I'm going to be throwing on each hole. We addressed that. So we got you, Mr. Enigma. Um, someone asked, how do you decide caching in a lower division versus being middle of a higher division? And I think this is such a great question because I was talking about, I think MA4, the novice division, FA4, the novice division, mm-hmm. is arguably one of the worst divisions for newer players in the game and here's why because there are so many tournaments where that division exists that someone gets put into that division in their first tournament ever but that person the skill range is so wide 
because if you don't have a rating, you can be put anywhere. Mm-hmm. So let's say for instance, that you have like Clayton, uh, we've talked about him a couple times, uh, best player on foundation staff that isn't Brody Smith for sure. Yeah. Uh, and so Clayton, let's say Clayton introduces a friend to disc golf. So Clayton is good enough. He's going to teach them how to be good, how to be mm-hmm. competitive. Yeah. So this dude comes out and we'll say that that guy, Clayton's a thousand rated. So Clayton coaches this guy up and now he's like playing around a 900 to 935 rated player because he's athletic. He's young. He got great teaching from the beginning, all of this. Mm -hmm. But if that guy looks and he's like, well, I've never played a tournament before. I'm going to go play a novice. So he shows up every 10 points of rating in theory is a stroke. So that means if this guy's like 935 ish average and he just has an average day out there, the cap to compete in MA4 or FA4, FA4, the number's even lower, but like MA4, he goes to compete there. The cap is 850. Mm-hmm. So all these people who are rated playing experience terms before, if he, if the new guy has an average day, he is going to win by eight strokes at least. If everyone else has an average day, mm-hmm. well, that's not fun because now that person who's playing MA4 and is a true MA4, they're out of it. Like mm-hmm. if they have their best day, they are asking for this guy to have his worst day yeah. for them to have a chance mm-hmm. at competing and winning this. So how do you like, how do you justify? I think that playing in a division, if you're playing in a division where you know, if I have a bad day, I'm probably still going to be competing for the win here. Move up because you're mm-hmm. not pushing yourself competitively yeah. to actually succeed. Uh, and it's, this isn't you versus the field. This is you versus you. You're literally mm-hmm. telling yourself, if I have a bad day on this course, I'm probably still going to get a trophy. You're playing in too easy of a division. Yeah. But I do think that you need to play in a quote, lower division sometimes to learn what it feels like to have that pressure of chasing a win, have that pressure of being on a lead card, things like that. in a second round that's helpful. But after you've had that experience a couple of times, I'm always team move up Mm -hmm. because the other thing is, is that even if you move up to a more difficult division in the first round, everyone's mixed together. So you're going to get to see that better play that you moved up to see. And that will open your eyes on how to just attack the course a little bit differently, playing Mm -hmm. with better people. But if you move down, that chance is not necessarily there. But the rounds auto sort themselves because round two, you're playing with people that shot similarly to you. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're going to end up on a card that is going to be pretty similar skill wise. Right. To what you would have had if you had played down anyways. So you're still going to get the same experience in terms of play, but you're going to have the opportunity at least the first round to see some better play Mm -hmm. because you moved up. So I, to me, that's always the learning experience. And eventually you start increasing in like, I played MA three, my first ever tournament got rated 928 after my first Mm -hmm. tournament. So I immediately moved up to MA one got absolutely curb stopped for a year. And then I started winning MA one events. I started being in the hunt for MA1 events. And so when that started happening, I remember playing a tournament and being like, oh, I could play really bad here and I probably still win MA1. Mm -hmm. I need to move up to MPO. So I did and got absolutely curb stomped for a year and then grabbed my first MPO win. Awesome. Okay, cool. And now you just, you kind of adjust over time. So, uh, and I think like Brad is in like a very, you're in a unique situation of you play with some really good players all the time. Mm -hmm. So how do you kind of pick like, cause MA4, if you're having an on day, it's going to be tough for people to compete with you in MA4. Right. Yeah. I think the, I've decided in the ones I'm going to sign up here for in May, um, I'm going to do MA3. Um, I could do MA4, like, I guess, by the requirements, I suppose, but depends on what day I'm going to have. And, like, I'll be, I still should be competitive in MA3. And I'll feel a lot better if I win MA3 than MA4. You know what I mean? 
Um, cause like you said, if I have a, a bad day, it, it also depends on the course. Let me caveat that. Yeah. Cause if we're playing at new London shorts, I'll probably pay it, play MA4 there. Um, yeah. you know, but I don't know, maybe not. I think I'll still play MA3. I think I feel like MA3. That's kind of where I'm at. I feel like if I go on rating, sure. I can play MA4. Um, if I go on my bad rounds, sure. I could probably play MA4, but I think I want the, with the challenge of MA3 and I just want to see kind of where I place there. Um, I do feel like I have those qualities and I do have experience. Like you said, I do, I do work in disc golf and I do have that experience. So I kind of feel like that holds some weight too. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. And I, once again, like I I'm thinking of just because you play MA4, that doesn't make it a bad thing either because it, it depends on what you're trying to get out of the event. Right. Like if you, I could, see, I could see a world, Brad, where you go play MA4 because you're trying to get into the tournament vibe. So we're also trying to figure out like you're used to competitive tournaments and archery. So the cool collectiveness can exist there, but disc golf can be like, while similar in mental side can feel different in execution. So mm -hmm. maybe tournament MA4 fits a little better, or you're like, Hey, I want to learn how it feels to compete for the win in disc golf right now. So I'm going to go to MA4 and learn that skill quicker. Like, I think that's something uh, I don't think that he'll, I don't think he'll mind, but Jason, uh, dear friend of the show, uh, mm -hmm. our most frequent guest, uh, and is sitting about 30 feet away from Brad right now, mm -hmm. uh, or standing, I think he's moving, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Jason is playing, he played MA four a couple of weeks ago, came out of the first round, shot the hot round by a mile mm -hmm. and then had the pressure of heading into the second round. And he will tell you, he doesn't know what went wrong with his putt, but he could not putt for the round. We've talked about it. He and I have. Uh, and so that's hard. But now Jason got to feel that pressure of chasing down the win. So he's learning competitive disc golf while also learning to chase that win. So there's value in both divisions. That's true. That's so, true. I didn't think about that part. So that's where I, I just look at uh, CK Alvunis asked this question. I think it just depends. There isn't a flat answer. Mm -hmm. There's pros and cons to both. I would honestly, I would say there's just pros to both. There's not really cons to either situation. Um, yeah. I will say this. If I play, as soon as I get a win in MA4, I will, I will move up if yeah. I play MA4. And that, I think that's a completely valid, like if you win a two rounder tournament in MA4, in MA3, anything like that, I would say move up. Uh, I have another student we talked about, I just talked about him, Wes, and that, we had him playing MA3 pretty much all year last year. And he won like four or five tournaments at the very end. And we kept saying, keep playing it. Mm -hmm. Because next year, we don't want you to be able to play MA3. Yeah. So play MA3, learn, 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 learn. And then when you rate out, bank, never go back. Mm -hmm. That's that's the dream. Uh, yeah. So uh, I want to answer one more and then we'll we'll call it. How's that sound? Yeah, I like it. Um, so, uh, to do, do, let's find a good one. Um, cause the easy one is how do you eat during the tournament? You want protein, but protein and carbs, but you don't want uh <laughs> sticky stuff. Um, mm -hmm. like slim gyms, love them, but I will not eat a slim gym without the wrapper around. Cause I get grease all over yeah. my fingers. Gross. Again, I'm an I'm another weird one. I probably won't eat anything. And I usually don't drink at all when I exercise. Yeah. I, the, I'm near the exact opposite on the drinking. I drink way yeah. more than I probably Yeah, should. I'll take a bottle of water. I'll take maybe a few sips if it's really hot. Afterwards, yeah. I'll chug, but not during. <laughs> um, don't recommend. Not a recommendation. All right. I like this one from Caddy Daddy DGC. How do you mentally recover from an easy missed putt or a shanked drive? Because this is where this is where tournaments really drive, just mm -hmm. drive you wild. Uh, and I'll use Jason once and again as an example here of like he knew he wasn't having a great round, and he was watching as his competitors just continue to catch him, mm -hmm. which also means that he's not throwing the shots he's looking for, and they just tend to compound on themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you bounce back from that missed putt, that missed drive? I would say that. If there's a reason to practice, it's not simply because it helps you score better. It's because you teach your body what is right. 
Mm -hmm. so that when you're frustrated or when something has gone wrong, you can almost to a degree try to turn your brain off of that past result and just go back into the smooth motion. Yeah. Because most often when we, if you're putting and you're nervous about making putts, what you'll end up doing is for our visual watchers, I'm going to back away from the camera a little bit, but you'll stab your shot because you're nervous. So you like retract in. Mm -hmm. So instead of smooth follow through to give the putt what it needs, you're going to, and it's going to come up short and you're going to Jasper it right in the cage. Yep. Makes sense. You physically mm -hmm. changed what you were doing because your nerves got a hold of you. Yeah. On drives, you've shanked a drive. Let's say you're grip locking to the right. Nine times out of 10, it's because you're moving your head to see the shot because you're nervous about where it's going to go. But when my head turns to see the shot, my shoulders follow as well, which caused me to open up sooner. And now I've pulled the shot to the right. Mm hmm my nervousness to want to see the shot so that I don't shank it actually leads to me shanking more shots. Yep. So I would say like, yes, we're all going to have frustrating putts. The best example in the world is Paul McBeth shot 18 down at Deglo, one of the greatest rounds that disc golf has ever seen. And he parred a hole. Mm -hmm. Should have been 19, Paul be better. Like, <laughs> sorry, dude. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. there's always going to be strokes that you leave out there. We're all going to have frustrating moments. It is not letting that frustrating moment impact the next shot. And as soon as you have that frustrating moment, pull yourself to the side, quick breather, and just tell yourself, what is my drive? Like, how is my drive? And just air, air swing it like shadow swing it. Okay, cool. You'll see me if I ever miss a putt, I cannot think of the last time that I missed a putt that I'm not like walking up to the basket and literally doing this. Not because I'm telling myself, you fool, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. I'm literally just, that's what my putting stroke is. Why don't you do that? Because mm -hmm. if we, we know if you do that, it goes in. Just do that. So that's, uh, was there anything in archery? Like, cause I'm sure because archery requires such precision, like you shoot a bad arrow. How did you reset in those worlds? I think it, I kind of try to, I try to, I'm not the best at applying it to disc golf, but in that world, it's more like, okay, well, I've got a lot more errors to shoot. So like, this is a very small percentage of mistake. What I have to do is minimize, like I can't raise that percentage. And what I got to do is typically with archery, a lot of the issues there are kind of the same. I'm like looking for my shot or I'm like releasing too early. I'm not staying on target long enough. And I'm not doing my follow through. So I think all of those, all of those routines and like the mental game of like, okay, that was one arrow. That was one, th one shot that I threw and I have 50 more to throw. So everybody, everybody has a few, like one shot, one stroke's not going to kill anybody. You can recover from that very easily. And to your point with the planning, if you come in with a plan and archery, there wasn't necessarily a plan per se because you the hard part about that was you're walking it's much like disc golf you're walking along a course it's in the woods it's up and down elevation um you're guessing distances like that's the biggest thing in archery you're like i'm guessing yardage and i have to adjust my sight mechanism to accommodate that right um so i think i think the biggest thing is like you know all right you still have a plan right that's why you're planning like i'm gonna birdie three to five holes because yeah. if you do gain that stroke, maybe you do birdie the five holes instead of, you know, or maybe you're throwing all the shots good, but you only birdie four holes. That's okay. It's still not going to like keep you out of the mix. Everybody can recover from that. And I think that the biggest thing is like, if you have a game plan, you just stay to the game plan. If you don't have a game plan, then you're going to start trying to be a hero and like, mm -hmm. okay, well, I know the next hole I usually par, but I'm going to jump up to this distance driver and try to park it and get my stroke back. That's to me, that's where I start falling apart is when I try to do stuff like that. Yeah. I, uh, man, I feel that in my soul. <laughs> I feel that in my soul. I'm going to, I'm going to get my stroke back. Mm. Like that phrase alone, mentally or actually said out loud, I've seen it just destroy mm. card after card, including my own cards. So, yeah. My follow up uh, question to that question to yeah. myself is, is like, 
when I have that mentality of like, I need to get my stroke back. The next, the next one needs to be from who, like <laughs> from whom am I trying to get this, but this stroke back? Yeah. You know, myself, the, the person I'm competing against, like, well, where is that coming from? I know the obvious answer is against the field. Right. But I'm just like, okay. Like it just, it's a very like aggressive statement, which just, just doesn't need to happen. And I think I play my best golf when I'm like, calm cool collected having fun and like that is a very like adversarial like i'm gonna go take what's mine mm. and nothing usually good comes of that from from me yeah yeah and i will i, I want to close this discussion out by saying like it's one thing to learn to compete in the sport of disc golf straight up like going out and playing a round of disc golf is a skill It is a sport that you mm -hmm. have got to learn how to do. And you, the better you do it, obviously the better you score mm -hmm. learning to compete in tournaments inside of disc golf yeah. is a new skill. Yep. While it seems very similar and it is, there are nuances to it, learning the rules, things like that. It's another beautiful thing. If you're going to play a tournament, please mm -hmm. read a rule book watch there are tons of youtube videos out there that are like here are five rules you need to know before you play a tournament talk about marking your lies mm -hmm. foot faults things like that all important all worth knowing because it's not it shouldn't be your card's responsibility to teach you how to play the game uh right. while you are playing in sanctioned tournaments you've agreed to sign up for this tournament you should also agree to prepare for said tournament and mm -hmm. knowing the rules but i talked about them as examples and i just want to brag on them as well Jason and Wes both have ratings goals they're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, they are playing more tournaments. We yep. can't just play one or two tournaments and expect to instantly achieve our rating. You've got to learn to flex and grow that muscle. Mm -hmm. And I have mad respect for the two of them because you can go back. Like if you looked them up on the PDGA, you can see just the climb that they've continued to have. Like, that's why I know that tournament kicks Jason so hard in the chest because he's good at those courses. He mm -hmm. knows what he's doing and he had it and it's like, ah, oh, it slipped away. And now we just got to, we got to tune it in and be like, this is why it happened. Yep. And that win is just waiting around the corner for him. Yeah. Like we know Very it's waiting close. around the corner. Yep. So, and it takes, if he didn't have the round two that he had, he wouldn't be the better player he is today. So we learn and we grow, uh, and you got to play those tournaments to do it. Uh, but while you're playing those tournaments, Brad, some things are going to happen to your discs mm -hmm. and we're going to pivot That's straight true. into it, my man, because you're yeah. going to lose a disc. You're going to get frustrated. I mean, Hey, I've got a pig that is dead in the middle of uh, new London because in the middle of a round, I got frustrated and I chucked it. Uh, yeah. so it happens. Sometimes you get a little, you lose some Frisbees, uh, mm -hmm. and where's a good place to go find them? foundationdisc.com what's new in the warehouse all right we got quite a bit going up so we did our pre-sale tour series uh disc craft stuff last week but they're all going up on the site like picture of every disc so i have a few here on my desk to show off i mean check out this zone this one's going in my bag robbie check that boy that's out so pretty dude and then um i have a vulture as well in this yes plastic. sir yeah i love that one that's there's not an ugly disc. They're all beautiful. They're all amazing. They all look great. It just depends on like what, if you have a color preference, great. There's probably one for you on there. If you're more like, hey, I just want something that looks wild and crazy, all of them. Just go on and pick one. They're all, it, but yeah, the picture of every disc. Um, I think the Kratos are sold out and the Vultures are sold out. Everything else is there at the time of filming this. We'll see, you know, on Friday at 5 p.m., but. Uh, they're going up, so they're live now. If you if you're hearing this, there hopefully there's some there for you. I know Jason's liking the the fear or the sorry the passion that's in this Z Flex Jawbreaker. Um, all of the all of the plastic is the same, but it's all beautiful. So check those out. Uh, we still have a few in the bag, FDs and Origins. Make sure you check those out as well. Um, for you MVP gyro knots, we have the Eclipse Crave this week. Yes, sir. Got me kind of excited. Look at the swirls on those rims. They're crazy. There's also the special edition that came out as well. And okay. then for you glitch, you lid lovers, here's another one. The pitch, the total eclipse pitch is dropping this Friday as well. 
A lot of you had pre-orders. Thank you for that. If not, um, there will be some available on the site Friday. So make sure you check those out. Uh, today on Thursday, the Royal Strive dropped. Mm. As, as well as the Royal Grand Hope, which feels incredible, by the way. Um, I don't need this disc, but I want it. That's for sure. Uh, disc Mania folks, CD1. This one has me intrigued, Robbie. 9, 5, negative 1, 2. Yeah. Um, I haven't thrown it yet, so I think maybe Jason and I will do Warehouse Guys throw on this one, but um, nice kind of like flip up uh, control driver with some overstable finish, so I'm always here for that. And then uh, Zone GT. We have some of those still in stock from the pre-order. Mm -hmm. Now they're up live with a picture of every disc, so make sure you check those out. And I think that's all we had this week. Yeah, and make sure you check out our um, Foundation Performance Hats. A bunch of those still in stock. Make sure you check those out. Um, but whatever you check out, make sure you look at recently restocked. That There's always stuff going up. Jason's put a bunch of stuff back in from vending that's gone up. So maybe there's been a, a random mold you're looking for. Good chance, especially like elevation or something, uh, that those are back up. Uh, but regardless, hope whatever you get in the mail is good. And I hope you keep in the bag. And we'll see you all next week for episode 99. <laughs>